good morning, everybody. I think we can, we can, it's time to get started with this distinguished lecture. First of all, let me welcome all of you and also welcome Chris Vanoff on behalf of the department director. This is the last, the third and last distinguished, distinguished lecture of the 2017 Distinguished Lecturer Program. And we have the pleasure to host uh, Chris, Chris Vanoff, who's um, a, a full professor. At, at, I like to start with this. He's a full professor, though part-time, at the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, where he received the PhD in, I should say, when? No, <laughs> it was in 1992, so he's uh, quite young, in, uh, in collaboration with Timek. Uh, he has held position as manager and director in many fields like sensors, imagers, 3D integration, uh, microelectromechanical systems, energy harvesting, body area networks, biomedical electronics, and wearable health. He has, uh, so he's a, but he's mainly a researcher because he has published over 600 papers in journals and conference proceedings, and he's given over 60 invited talks. Uh, at present, he leads EMEC wearable health uh, research and development, uh, research and development across three EMEC sites in Eindhoven, Leuven, and Ghent. Uh, today will give us a lecture on virtual personal health coach research program launched by EMEC. Uh, this is a research program that combines wearable technology and data science, so it's of interest for the most uh, people in this department, uh, to provide new coaching methodologies for lifestyle management with the ambition to have a big impact on preventive health and reduce future incidence of chronic diseases. So, join me, please, in welcoming Chris, and I'll leave the stage to him. Thank you so much. It's an, an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I will indeed tell you our vision of the future and how AI and technology and wearable technology together can have a big impact. Now, first, I want to briefly say a few words about iMac. Um, those of you that know iMac certainly know it from a technology point of view, as uh, CMOS technology is our, our core and has been our core. Uh, but since last year, uh, we merged uh, an other organization into iMac called iMinds. And that was about 1,000 people doing mainly data science and software. And so together, we are now far more able to tackle some of these new challenges that I will talk to you about. At the moment, we have about 3,500 researchers and engineers uh, at IMEC across the different sites. And because Belgium is so small, we do need to recruit from all over the world. And we have, at the moment, close to 80 different nationalities uh, at IMEC, making it a very wonderful multicultural environment. Most of our research is in headquarters Leuven uh, in Belgium. Uh, second largest site is Eindhoven, the Netherlands. And we recently started an IMEC in Florida, uh, in Orlando, focusing on, on imaging millimeter wave terahertz. The other locations you see are more for um, relationships to our customers. So now, now back to the story. I'll start with some bad news, and, and some of you may know that. In the United States, there are 117 million people with a chronic illness. That's half of the adult population. And if you switch to Europe, it looks a bit better. One in three adults has a chronic disease. And if you move to Japan, it looks at first very good. Only 10% of the people have a chronic disease. But even in Japan, the cost of healthcare rises faster than the increase in the gross domestic product. And it's for those reasons that uh, all these developed countries are spending about 70 to 80% of the entire healthcare cost 
on taking care of chronic patients. And what are those patients? Well, for example, those are patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. If you have that disorder, you need supplemental oxygen. And there are 174 million patients with this. And one of the big challenges is that there is no remote, easy monitoring to detect when the patient is getting more sick. There is no wearable that tells you or that closes the loop to the supply. Another disorder is sleep apnea. There are also over 100 million patients worldwide. And, and the problem is that a lot of people don't even know they have sleep apnea. It is a, a pulmonary disorder where the upper airways collapse, uh, typically during sleep when you're lying down, and so you stop breathing. It happens 100 times a night or even more, and it's a big strain on the body. Uh, it's almost like drowning uh, for, for half a minute or a minute, and it leads to chronic disorder. And the diagnosis is done in a sleep clinic. And there are not so many beds in a sleep clinic looking at 100 million patients. In the United States, 19 million Americans have sleep apnea and don't know they have it because of the few diagnostic methods. It would be great if you had a wearable device that could warn people, that could really monitor this, so that you don't need a therapeutic device, as is shown here, that blows air and oxygen into you to prevent the airways from collapsing. So there's a need, there is no solution. Another uh, serious disorder is congestive heart failure, where the heart is no longer able to supply sufficient oxygen. And as a consequence, uh, there are severe side effects. For example, you get fluid that starts to build up in the lungs, uh, preventing oxygen absorption when you lie down, or fluid pooling in the legs if you have right-sided heart failure. There are 26 million patients worldwide, and there is no indicator, no device that tells them that uh, fluid is building up. So they have to go to the hospital when they really feel bad. X-ray pictures are taken of the thorax, and then fluid is removed. Invariably, the patients get worse and worse after every hospital episode. They never recover completely. If there would be a wearable that could really tell them what the fluid buildup was, Medication could be changed, hospital admissions could be prevented or significantly reduced, and the life expectancy of these patients would increase. But there is no solution yet. As you know, there are many people with hypertension. In the United States alone, there's about 80 million uh, people with high blood pressure. The worst part of it is not that number. The worst part of it is that people don't change their behavior when they get that message. A lot of people have such a blood pressure cuff, and when it says 145 over 95, they will say, okay, this is a high number, but so what? I don't feel different. And so one in eight changes their lifestyle, and as a consequence, chronic disease is the result. Cardiovascular disease is the result. A more continuous monitoring tool then this episodic uh, measurement could change the behavior of the patients. But it's not there. This device is 100 years old, and the only thing that has been modified in 100 years is the digital display. The rest is still nominally the same as it was before. So it's really important to help these patients by creating smarter outpatient home monitoring solutions for diagnosis, for therapy follow-up. And it, just, it does not just need hardware, it needs hardware and it needs algorithms to close the loop. And we have been creating those. We have been creating monitoring solutions. And when you need to take care of a patient at home, it has to be comfortable. Initially, we make a box. When it works and we test it in a hospital, we go to miniaturization. Because in a hospital, the comfort of the patient is not the first requirement, it's the diagnostic capability. At home, and to have user compliance, it needs to be convenient. So we work on that. And, and we've had some successes where those devices 
led to FDA approval last year with one of our customers. It was not first time right. We thought eight years ago that it would be easy, but it took us eight years, three chip generations, and so quite an iterative approach until we really got it right. Similarly, for neurological recording, we had medical approval, or a customer had medical approval last year. Also there, iterative process of creating generations of headsets and chips for brain monitoring. And in other cases, we're still ongoing. The work is still ongoing to improve the hardware and create the algorithms. And miniaturization is important. Uh, it leads to cost reduction, it leads to convenience for the patient. And at the moment, we're looking at single chip solutions. Uh, what you see here is towards a single chip with radio, with signal processing, with an in analog interface, with encryption. Everything you need, all you still need is a battery. And this could become a very inexpensive disposable device, a patch. That could also be deployed in low- and middle-income countries uh, and change chronic disease management there. The features uh, that I just mentioned are, are repeated here. Uh, everything you normally would put on multiple uh, circuits and you would create uh, a small system is put in one single chip here. Target price, two dollars. Now, just making the hardware helps, but is not sufficient. And a lot of validation is needed because we're not creating gadgets. And we thought it would be easier, and sometimes we needed to monitor 50 or 100 patients, sometimes a thousand. And not in all cases did we come to a solution or a good solution yet. But it is indispensable that we go through these clinical studies and uh, with partners. Some are close by. Uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands, some are far away, like Johns Hopkins and Osaka University. But this is a key part uh, in our R&D. We've also helped some startups uh, in the more consumer health space, like Bloom for contraction monitoring of pregnant women and CloudTag for weight management. Now, these devices, and this is part of my introduction, these devices seem promising for chronic disease follow-up, particularly if you need to monitor for a long period of time. But they're not so convenient. As you know, not everybody wants to wear a wristband smart wearable. I'm not even wearing one at the moment, and this is my key research. So people don't like those devices necessarily, and for that reason, we started looking at non-contact sensing. Can you detect without touching the body? Because elderly people that need to be monitored for weeks and weeks would get irritation uh, on the skin. Children, infants, uh, could also not tolerate such electrodes. And for that reason, we started looking at all types of non-contact sensing. Capacitive, for example, and what you see here is an electrocardiogram detected through bed linen for a patient lying in a bed. And you see that depending on the location of the different electrodes, you really get very good morphology of electrocardiogram. We're at the moment even able to do this through shirt, through jacket, and we're validating this in a number of hospital and home scenarios. Similarly, we're able to detect respiration uh, rate and respiration volume using capacitive bioimpedance sensing. Also promising for this pulmonary disorder uh, diagnosis or patient follow-up applications. We're looking at radar for uh, both heart rate and respiration rate detection. What you see here, you see subject one and two. Uh, we are able to detect and separate heart rate and respiration rate of those two different people in the room at two and three meter distance. Also here we're looking at where can this be used? Is this suitable in a hospital or is this only in a home health, uh, consumer health application? Or is this useful in an automotive application and we created those sensors and put them on a car seat 
where we're currently doing tests while driving. Can we detect the driver health? Because there's a lot of interest in that, also for prevention. Now, this was a long introduction to show that we spent years working on patient monitoring. And, and we think this is relevant, but on the other hand, we should be thinking much longer term. We should be thinking a generation ahead, and what could we do in terms of changing healthcare in the future? And for that, maybe a question to you. What do you think? What percentage of chronic disease could be prevented? Would it be 20% or 50% of all disease or 80% of all disease that is, in fact, preventable? Well, the reality is that 80% of all chronic disorders, and some of those that I mentioned, cardiovascular, cardiopulmonary, they are linked to our behavior, and they are, in principle, preventable. That would be phenomenal. You could really reduce the healthcare cost by 50%, 60%. 1 1.3 trillion dollars in the United States, in principle, could be saved. And think of the benefits for the patient, of course. Uh, and does the next generation, these young people, do they know? Will they prevent disorder? Well, look at their diet. 90% of them eats too much sodium, too much salt. Over a third is not eating fruit and vegetables every day. It's not a good start. Young adults spend about 8 to 12 hours a day behind or in front of a small or a big screen. They're insufficiently active, and you see the statistics in Europe and United States, leading also to obesity, but it's more a combination of weight and cardiorespiratory fitness that is really detrimental. Or think about their stress. We typically think that stress is a disorder that affects more middle-aged workers, but in fact, a quarter of young adults say they are very, they're highly stressed at work, and two-thirds say they have no idea how to manage it. They have no idea to whom to turn or what techniques or solutions there are. And smoking is, is going down, but it is still a problem. And drinking is also going down, but binge drinking uh, is still a severe problem. 15% of young adults do binge drinking, and that was defined as three to four times a month drinking way too much. And of course, if you take all these things together, we know it's only a matter of time before these young people will become older patients, and the cycle repeats itself. And, and that's what we really should be tackling. And how can we prevent this from happening? And, and here is, in fact, after all this bad news, here's the first good news. We have the solution. So, sit back and watch. The solution to prevent this is all you have to do is lead an active life, eat a balanced diet, don't smoke, don't drink, and manage your stress. That's all you need to do. And I did not expect applause, really, huh? because we know, we know this already, and we've known this for decades. But it's really hard, apparently. Well, have you ever tried to change your behavior? Maybe smoking, drinking, eating, fitness? And uh, if I would ask you, probably many of you have said yes, and very few will say that they are perfect the way they are. But then a follow-up question is, is that easy, is that difficult, or is that nearly impossible? Those that have tried will indeed say that it is really, really difficult. 90% of people that stop smoking start again. 65% of people that go on a diet regain their original weight after two to three years. So it's really, really difficult. And that's also known, and that's something we want to change and where we think that a combination of technology and artificial intelligence is going to give new tools for behavior change. And I'm going to explain that uh, now. We call that activity a research program, iMac iChange, uh, aiming 
a disruptive, disrupting preventive health. And we call it behavioral technology. And it is a toolbox. It's not a magic solution. It's not a pill. But it is a toolbox of ingredients, of approaches, hardware and software that help people to change. And obviously, it's not just technology. If it was that simple, we would have already solved it. It needs to be a combination, an interdisciplinary combination of technology, data science, and behavioral science, psychology, and psychiatry. These fields, particularly these fields, are very technology unaware. Many medical disciplines have used technology for decades, and even longer. But psychiatry and psychology is typically, has been an area that typically used questionnaires, interviews, and technology is only now starting to enter this field. And we are conducting a large number of trials with behavioral scientists, with psychiatrists, to find out where can it work, and maybe where does it not work. What are the applications we are covering and we have in mind? Obviously, an application like to help people stop smoking. Or rather, to help them prevent or to prevent that they start again. If we could detect that you are in the mood for a cigarette, we could give some healthy advice. So that's key. That's how we see it work. Detect a craving that you're in the mood for a cigarette and then give the right trigger. Because what does not work to tell is to tell people every morning, please don't smoke. They want to stop. So what you need is the right feedback at the right time. And to find out the right time, this is where we think technology to learn habits can make a difference. It can also be, of course, about stop drinking. It can also be about helping people to keep taking their medication because this is another big challenge. Or it can be about helping people with a balanced diet, or helping them lose weight, not with generic advice, but with personalized advice, or to manage eating disorders. We are currently embarking on three trials following people with anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating to give insights in the psychophysiology related to these disorders and hopefully improve the coaching of these patients. But it's not just about problems. There are, also, there are also positive effects, like increasing fitness or even improving uh, athlete performance. And a big area is mental health. None of us has a really good idea about our stress levels. If I would ask you, did you have more or less stress last week than this week, you only know the answer if something really special happened last week or this week. Otherwise, people have no clear idea. It's subjective, it's not quantitative, it's highly qualitative. Yet, it is key that we know our stress, that we manage our stress, because otherwise, acute stress may lead to chronic stress, buildup, may lead to burnout or depression. And getting those insights in what causes stress would really help to prevent these disorders. And if you unfortunately would have burnout, today therapy is used uh, using a therapist. You see the therapist and then you go home for a month. During that month, the therapist has no idea whether you're getting better or worse or not improving at all. Psychiatrists have told us that they would really like to see a tool, not for diagnosis, but for therapy success, to see is this treatment helping or should I intervene? Rather than waiting a month, should I intervene and should I change it for the better? But also here, in terms of stress, there are countless positive applications. A week ago, I had a very good day and in about five hours, I did what normally takes me two days. I would really like to know what got me into the zone and made me productive that day. 
if we would get those insights, we could make every day like that. And either you accomplish a lot more or you go home earlier, depending what you want. But it would really change the way we work. Today, our work is organized by the presence of our body. A meeting is organized by physical ability of several people to be somewhere, not by mental ability. It is said that in a generation from now, we should all be organizing meetings according to our ability to work together. It is known by psychologists that before 11 o'clock you should not have a meeting because you're so focused in the morning, you should do work that really benefits from high concentration. Around 4 o'clock when you're more tired, you should start having brainstorms because it's ideal when you're tired to think out of the box. Psychologists know this. We are not using those techniques. If we would have a wearable that would indeed monitor our own productivity, our mental ability, our work and our teamwork would be radically different. And indeed, our productivity and our outcome would improve. So it's not just about bad habits, it's also about countless positive applications. And I only mentioned a few but maybe you already think of many, many others. Now, there is a challenge, because otherwise it would have been achieved already. We're all different, we're all unique. How can you give personalized advice? That's also where most of the behavioral apps are failing, and even the fitness apps. They give generic advice, and the user gets disappointed because it's advice that's not very suitable for him or her. If you're a morning person or an evening person, you need different advice. And a smartphone app should know whether you're a morning person or an evening person. It can be detected from the use of your smartphone. But most apps don't do that. And that's a trivial example. But so, by learning a lot more about your own habits, you can indeed give more tailored advice. And the advice also is different in style. Maybe you need a gentle coach to help you changing behavior. People say that I'm a stubborn person. I probably need a drill sergeant approach, an app that is far more strict to tell me, Chris, do this, or I will not listen. That type of personalization is going to be key in user acceptance as well. Some people need a carrot, other people need a stick. And, and it's also, it's not just personalization, it's also changing over time. We change over time, and what I like today is not what I like tomorrow. Those behavioral apps have to follow, and have to follow your habits and your changing habits, so they again adapt, because that way they will start acting like a real-life personal coach, like a friend and you listen to that real-life coach or friend. And motivation for changing behavior, internal motivation is good, but as you know from your uh, New Year's resolutions, it's not enough. Huh? That alone is not enough. And the key, the key that we are looking for is triggers. Suppose I have stress at the moment. If I had a stress watch that tells me, Chris, you have stress. What am I going to do now? Stop this talk? This is not possible. So either I would need my app and wearable to tell me before this, this presentation, Chris, prepare this way to manage or reduce your stress. Or afterwards, it would tell me, great, you've done it. Now do some mindfulness, some respiration, or go for a walk. That way, you can prevent adverse effects in the future. So finding triggers and giving the right feedback at the right time, that's going to be key. And as you can imagine, that's indeed where a wearable and a smartphone and combining that data can gather such information. So personalization is important, and not just the personalization that we know from most of our apps, huh? that, that asks for age, sex, uh, weight and height. There are plenty of people like that, plenty of people like me, but they're all different. So you need to combine what we call digital phenotyping. It is 
physiological information, contextual information, habits from your smartphone, from wearables, vital signs added. And in the first phase, what we, what we are, can already do, that is, we compare your data to other people. And we say, well, you look a bit like this group of people, like you see there uh, a red circle. You look a bit like that yellow group of people. And we give you advice that seems to work for that group. It's not personalized or hyper-personalized, but it is already better than generic. That's the first stage. But gradually, of course, the app learns more and more about you, and it becomes more and more individual. And in the future, digital genotyping will be added to give even more insights, but then we are probably 10 years or 15 years from now. So, what, is, what are we now actually doing in this digital phenotyping? Well, we are combining individual characteristics of people through a combination of diverse sources. Here you see several of the sources we've used in large trials. A band that detects skin conductance, skin temperature, activity, a patch, a medical grade patch that, that, that monitors electrocardiogram and, uh, and actimetry. Your smartphone, where the volunteers have released a lot of information on their location, on their activity, on their uses, usage of the phone, when are they making phone calls, um, so voice is even being used, and other uh, characteristics. In addition, we are giving pop-ups to the user, we're asking questions, because there is, particularly in these trials, there's no magic, there is no, otherwise no annotation. So we ask the person the opinion about his or her stress levels, are you in control, are you being controlled? Are you feeling happy or sad? Um, did you sleep well? What about your gastrointestinal problems? Um, a number of questionnaires and even a small stress test is included because that is some type of benchmark to set a reference. And so with this, we've done that now on, on uh, almost 900 people, we indeed start to see behavior, see habits, and find patterns. And that, we have not given feedback yet at the right time, but that's what we're doing in a trial next year. Today, it is about finding the correlations and creating the algorithms. In the long term, we also think this will give insight in what causes disease. And that's where pharma and medical device companies are very interested in. But first, it's about gathering the data. And and a stress trial that I will tell you about now, that's, that's our biggest example. Because stress is a big challenge. The healthcare cost, the medical cost in Europe is 63 billion euro a year. And the cost to companies and society is even larger, it's 500 billion euro due to lost productivity or to people being at work but not working. It's called presenteeism. And for that, we conducted a large study, probably 50 times larger than any study in the uncontrolled environment, where we try to measure stress objectively using these diverse physiological sensors. And then we are building up algorithms that we call digital phenotyping algorithms for habit extraction. And in the next phase, starting next year, we are looking at how can we now start to use this new knowledge into the right feedback? And this was a month ago. A month ago, we had followed 826 people. Now we are at 905. And by the end of October, we have 1,000 people completed. From uh, 7 to 10 companies have we found volunteers to do a stress at work exercise, following them for an entire week. And of course, you need to get people's input. We have collected around, at the moment, about 26,000 self-reported stress responses. And of course, it's about physiological data as well. Using these different sensors, we have collected nearly 100,000 hours of physiological data. So it's a huge 
data set combining time series, combining it with unstructured data, categoric information, and it's not all complete. It's in the it's in a free living environment. It's not in a hospital environment. Here and there, data is missing. Here and there, quality of data isn't good. That's what real life is. And of course, we have to be able to deal with that and find unsupervised learning methods, um, because otherwise, this is not would, this would not be scalable. And and we get out of this some clear information. For example. This is the, the circles that you see is the average, and the, the, the bar that you see is the standard deviation. Men sleep better than women. And five on an international sleep score is really the edge of your sleeping bad if your score is above, above five. Same for stress. Uh, 16 is uh, on that perceived stress scale is a sign of high stress, there is a problem. Men have less stress than women. Now, this is known, but it is also good that it comes out of this very large test. It shows that our, our sample population is representative. At the same time, we get some more surprising results. If you do sports for more than one hour a day, your sleep improves. If you do sports, one or more hours a week, your perceived stress goes down significantly. Also comes out of the analysis. You have to be careful here um, that we don't flip cause and effect. This is a correlation, but it doesn't say what is the cause and what is the consequence. We also found out that the higher your education, the lower your stress. This is, of course, also not a direct causal relationship, but a higher education ensures a better job, a higher salary, less financial worries, and such things may lead to lower stress. It's not as simple as immediate cause and effect. Now, analyzing the physiological data uh, is a challenge, because as I indicated, the data quality isn't always great, so you need quality indicators. And we've created those so that we can analyze that entire data set and throw out when the data cannot be trusted, because otherwise you will jump to the wrong conclusion. So a lot of our effort, and we underestimated it, it took us uh, between six and nine months, to create quality indicators so that we really end up what you see in blue is the original data, a snapshot, and in green only the quality data, that we only end up with trustable raw data from which we then extract features. That's a severe compression then. Raw data uh, is many terabytes. The features, that's only what you want to extract. And out of electrocardiogram, we can extract more than a dozen statistical features, and you see here just one, like heart rate. Out of skin conductance, galvanic skin response, you can also extract a number of statistical features, and you see one, the skin conductance level in time. And then we start combining these features to see which is now related to stress. And for example, one of those uh, standardized heart rate features is representative for the entire population of your stress level. You see again the average of the population when no stress, low stress, or high stress occurs. Indeed, that heart rate feature is nicely proportional. Skin conductance, people start sweating under stress, is not as indicative to distinguish between no stress and low stress, but for high stress, it is indeed uh, deterministic. And so, again, that's a feature we can use. But for you, maybe heart rate will change a lot under stress. Maybe for me, it's skin temperature that changes. So we do need a learning algorithm that selects these different uh, features and creates the optimum combination that is the most reflective of your immediate stress. And that's what we've done. And if you then follow a person over a week, this is what you see. This is uh, one week or five days of following a person. Blue was his or her own stress self-assessment. 
And the pluses that you see are what the algorithm predicted. And in the majority of cases, it is indeed able to capture your stress. And we should even wonder that when it is not accurate, when there is no match between self-reporting and algorithm, maybe the algorithm is right, and maybe the person was subjective, or it was indicative of an event that is already past, and we only ask people about their stress 12 times a day. So maybe they missed it, they overlooked it, but the physiological signals, signals captured it. This is what we're now going to use for giving people insight in what causes their stress. And we've also started to use it on some patients. Patients that uh, complained about a stress disorder. So they, they felt stressed, they were not, they didn't have burnout or depression, they were at work. But we compared them to healthy controls, and we could see that some of their physiological markers were very different from that control population. So we think that if we follow you, and your signals start to change over time, that indeed we could capture an increased risk, that you're at risk of, uh, of entering an episode where you have a stress disorder. So it's not yet sufficient proven. This was on uh, 15 patients and 25 controls, but it's very promising that we are getting some early insights in changes uh, that are linked to patient uh, characteristics. Switching then to smoking, uh, we are following 100 people that are still smoking and that want to stop. And uh, we call that study the ASSIST study for the S and S stands for stop smoking. And uh, we were really lucky that we found on the market a lighter, a Bluetooth lighter, that sends a signal to your smartphone when you light a cigarette. I don't know why anybody would buy that device, but it is great for a clinical research study, because we needed to indeed have an exact time stamp of when a person is smoking. And you cannot ask that by smartphone, ask a person, please give that input. It will not be for 100% correct. We found that, uh, we found that uh, lighter, and so that is really giving us the gold reference of the smoking episode. And what we are doing is following where are people smoking, uh, when are they smoking, and can we detect from physiological or mental stress signals, can we detect cravings? And so, indeed, location. We did that now on, uh, on a subset of people, uh, and signals are okay, and we seem to be able to, to capture everything all, all right. Uh, and we're starting uh, next month or December, no, December, we're starting with a trial on 100 smokers that we follow for four weeks, initially for smoking habits, but then they stop and we will see, can we then detect these cravings that we expect will be higher because they have stopped smoking. And of course, it has to be anonymized. Here you see in an anonymized GPS location where people are smoking, and the blue bars are how many cigarettes is that person smoking. And indeed, so we can chart where, when, how many cigarettes to gain insight also in where should we give people encouragement. Locations where you smoke a lot, this is where you need more encouragement. And we start seeing certain habits, certain patterns, and it's clear if you're at work, your smoking behavior is different than when you're at home. We also see that if there is a long meeting and people are not able to smoke afterwards, there's a tendency to smoke more cigarettes or even two, two cigarettes behind one another. These are just the patterns. We're analyzing the patterns, we're now adding mental health information to hopefully capture uh, the cravings. Similarly, for eating disorders, we start following uh, patients with anorexia and bulimia during eating, because eating is a very stressful uh, event for such patients. And we hope, together with the psychiatrists, to get psychophysiological insights in what causes the stress and whether therapy is helping. 
And these were a few examples that show we are not yet there. And I, I probably showed you that there is still a lot of challenge. It's a challenge both on the sensor level, because I showed you a stress sensor. And we are very optimistic that this is now going to give you good enough personal mental stress assessment. But for many of the other applications, you probably need to detect other quantities. Uh, quantities not just uh, by monitoring phys electrophysiology, probably by analyzing uh, other body fluids like sweat, like tear fluid. We think it's an illusion that it can just be done with a wearable. It probably may need episodic uh, sampling of other quantities. So there's a need for further improved sensing. There's also a need for a lot more uh, AI research in this space. We see very promising insights, um, but it is still a challenge um, to combine contextual information, categoric information, and these time series, and how to deal with the fact that the data quality is not going to be perfect. And if you only would do a trial in a controlled environment, it's not representative. For example, it's really simple to do a stress detection in a controlled trial. Because if you do a controlled test and you scare people, you're going to detect that with 100% accuracy. Detecting stress at work is far more subtle. So it's far harder to do. And the signal quality is far worse because it's in an environment with many confounding parameters. So dealing with that is still a challenge that needs a lot of research. And one of the other take-home messages is that today people use wearables, but typically those people that use them don't really need them. Fitness trackers are used by people that are already fit. How do we convince the other 90%? And it is by making sure that these wearables are not just passive data loggers. They have to interact a lot more with you. They also should ask questions. Today, an, an algorithm, an app, gives you feedback. It thinks it's correct. It should, in fact, be asking you, hey, I think you may have stress. Is this right? The user can this way help to further personalize the app by taking your own opinion on board. This is going to make every user a lot more engaged and interested to keep using it. Because after a few wrong answers, you're going to say, this doesn't work. In contrast, after the user helps to improve the outcome, it will be better, and you will rely on it even more. So there are countless opportunities. We're only covering a few. Um, we're definitely open to interact uh, with you on exploring other applications and on the other sensing metrics that may be beneficial in this entire behavior change uh, field. Clearly, it's just a beginning, but it's a huge opportunity. Uh, and it's really a stepping stone towards preventive health. 80% of illness is in principle preventable, even if it doesn't work for the 80%, but only for half of those people, or a quarter, the impact on both the healthcare system and on the quality of life of the patients is tremendous. And uh, 2,500 years ago, Heraclitus said that the only thing that's constant is change. We think the only thing that's constant is I change. Uh, we have to change over time. And and somebody has said that, uh, that uh, we should aim for a world without disease by 2030. And, and maybe you think that this was said by a dreamer, by somebody who's too enthusiastic, or maybe by a startup that's very bold. But that statement, a world without disease by 2030, was said by Bill Haidt, the global head of R&D at Johnson & Johnson. So imagine a company like Johnson & Johnson makes such an ambitious, bold statement to which they're adding 
that a key area that needs research is behavioral science. And they are saying we need to put the best minds and a lot of effort in creating such preventive health technology. That definitely encouraged us to conduct research in that field. And I hope it also gets you enthusiastic to perform research in this domain. Thank you for your attention. OK, Chris, thank you very much for your very interesting and rich uh, presentation. We have now time for a few questions. Uh, don't worry, in 10 minutes you'll be able to go out and have a cigarette or chew hot dogs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, maybe I'll start with uh, one question. Well, I'm an hardware guy, so uh, your, the focus of your, of your presentation was mainly on data science, as I see. But I'm very interested to understand what you think is the bottleneck on the physical layer to realize this uh, device. So on the, both on the raw hardware, uh, microchips, and uh, also on the communication layer. Absolutely, indeed. Uh, the, but there are, I talked more about the application and the fact that data analytics gives you a lot of insight. Um, but it's only as good as the information that you can feed it. And the hardware today is capturing still a very limited set of parameters and, and is far from ideal for stress monitoring we created a custom watch, skin conductance, skin temperature. Um, but for heart rate and heart rate variability, which you really need to uh, use in your algorithms, we use the chest patch, which is great in a trial, which is absolutely not usable in practical life. It has to all be in, for example, a watch. Heart rate variability at the wrist is an unsolved problem. Optical uh, photoplethysmography is giving you average heart rate okay, is not giving you heart rate variability accurately enough. So the ability to sense this far more accurately and also respiration rate, respiration volume, is in principle possible from optical analysis, pulse oximetry at the wrist, in principle, but it's not good enough. And it needs better sensing, it definitely needs local processing, because that's the other point. In the trial, we store all the information on the band, so we don't have to transmit. Otherwise, we would not have enough battery life. You need to embed the entire uh, feature extraction locally and deal with motion artifacts and so on. So, Motion artifact detection, local feature extraction is going to be necessary to limit the amount of data that you transfer to the phone. Um, because, and, and there, even finding out whether you should run an algorithm partly on your wearable, partly on the phone, partly in the cloud, this decision, where are you going to analyze? If you're indoor, maybe you will use cloud because this will be connected to Wi-Fi if you're somewhere in the field. Maybe the quality of your algorithm will go down and you only use the wearable. So that part, embedding local processing and lower power feature extraction, that's another hardware challenge. Um, I've also, I've indicated wearables, but we think you need to sample, certainly in a validation trial, you need to sample other quantities. Even cortisol, a stress hormone, ideally you want to sample that in these trials. Today this is done typically by a saliva sample that gets analyzed in the lab. You may not want to use it in real life for the wearable, but in a trial to have really gold standard answers, you may need it. Today, real-time cortisol sensors uh, are inadequate. So 
there is quite a whole layer of biochemical sensing that needs to be needs to be added, so that at least in the trial stage, uh, you get far better feedback. Whether you still need it in the application stage is another question. But so there, for sure, there are needs, there are challenges. Um, autonomy, power autonomy, has not been solved. Um, I think that's somewhat a subset of uh, of the challenges. Any other questions? Thank you for the impressive uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think there are some um, barriers to this technology in the, for example, in the medical community? Because now we are, for engineer, we probably, we agree that it is a be very beautiful future for us. But, um, so this, can you comment on this? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, yeah, that's, that's another good, it's another good question indeed. Huh? Uh, is this a technology push or is there a big need? Well, you see from the numbers and preventing disease, that's relevant. But indeed, is there traction? Johnson & Johnson Pharma clearly says prevention uh, is something that we need to work on. They are also indicating, pharma companies uh, in general are indicating that if you add a behavioral layer to medication, you will increase patient compliance and adherence. And as you know, pharma companies uh, struggle with the fact that after their patents expire, medication becomes generic. They're also saying, well, by that time, we can also enrich our medication with a behavioral change wearable device to together have a higher quality result. So from a number of those companies, we captured that there is an interest to enrich and to really move from a volume-based business, which pharma was, more pills, more money, to an output and outcome-based business that you will pay for being healthy. They will get money for keeping you healthy rather than paying per pill. So there is a, an understanding, an interest. The healthcare system has to adapt as well. And this is where insurers are very interesting, interested. I've talked to a number of insurance companies and they see a direct benefit. They see that in many applications, including driving behavior, uh, so in many activities, tracking behavior and being preventive and even paying for that, it will save them money. So they are really seeing an immediate benefit because they do cash out anyway. So spending a bit now to save a lot later on a group of patients for them is a very appealing and almost necessary move. Last week I was at an event organized by insurance companies and it was particularly about connected health and preventive health and how it can improve their work because they all realize that the healthcare systems otherwise is on a on a road to being no longer affordable. So yes, there is there is traction uh, from those important stakeholders. According to my understanding, your approach is mainly based on biometric signal, signals, right? Temperature, heart rate, and so on. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you consider also other type of signals, like behavioral uh, signals in the more general terms, like what people do during their day mm -hmm. in terms of you know meeting other people, walking, yeah. or doing something like yeah. that. And another, I would also like to hear from you a comment regarding these serious games or these brain training apps that you can see now are you know, very, yeah. very popular uh, also in the web. So do you think that they are useful, might be used also for your prevention techniques, mm -hmm. or maybe are just uh, have a temporary effect? Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, whether we use other information sources or other sensing, uh, correct, as, as you point out, uh, today we have, it's more 
biometrics, physiological information, electrophysiology, uh, and, and context. From the smartphone, we do get location where people are and whether they're talking. But it's not, we, are, we don't think that's indeed sufficient. It's a good start. It's what we could do in a large trial. But at the moment, we are looking at more rich information from sound, from video, from imagery, because it takes stress. Facial expressions are, of course, very indicative about stress as well. And we are looking and setting up a trial. How can we make that work, either with your smartphone or with your laptop uh, camera, that we indeed periodically get such snapshots, or when the physiological information changes, that we then engage and start such extra data capture. Because we think, indeed, there is a lot of value in there that should be added. And all sources, uh, and as you said, te teamwork, whether people are working together, is also indicative. So you need to combine more. This was a start. Imagery and more audio is definitely something we're adding because it's so relevant. So yes, this will further improve uh, outcome, classification, prediction. Uh, your question on the on neurofeedback and apps um, and whether they have a lasting impact, honestly, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't have an answer there. We are engaged in VR, AR for behavior change. We're starting this because, indeed, we see this is an area with a lot of potential. Um, whether, whether this is something that is a permanent, has a permanent effect, or whether this is short time, the, f the future will tell, or maybe there is literature on it, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. But it's definitely, it's, an, it's again in the entire behavior change and habit research, it's, it's definitely a relevant additional tool. Uh, well, thank you for your presentation. Well, maybe I'm thinking a bit too forward, but uh, my question is about uh, acceptance. I mean, as far as you work with volunteers, they clearly see a good thing to work, to be working with. Uh, do you think it could be uh, seen as too unobtrusive uh, by an uh, ordinary uh, subject and that this might affect the feedback that you get from this uh, sensing? It's a, it's a very, very good question as well. The, and it goes to the heart of the matter. Um, the, we know what I showed we know you have to eat healthy and move and all those things it is indeed known yet people don't do it people do like fast foods and do like to drink or smoke so internal motivation to change is also not always there and and keeping internal motivation is going to be key and and it will not work for everybody for sure um, it will partly, partly be enforced. Um, healthcare, the healthcare system and insurance is already doing that in a way. Uh, in many countries, insurance companies are asking uh, your weight or whether you, sm you, you smoke and the premium is adjusted. So, particularly in that field, people are saying, okay, people will be required to wear a device and as a benefit you will have a lower premium so it's the it's more the stick or the carrot and the stick approach which is going to help and in a way it's a little bit like wearing a seat belt people don't want to wear a seat belt and it it had to become law before people did it yes it's not fun and it is and it is let's say rude that you're being forced to do so but it is for the good, and similarly to uh, similarly to uh, brushing your teeth, this also is a routine that is not so old. Well, 50 years old or something. Um, it's also not something very normal yet. People started doing that, and ultimately, long term, it benefited their dental hygiene. So, 
what you have to do is indeed partly enforce it, partly make sure it can become a routine. Once it's a routine, and particularly if you get some positive feedback, if it's not just telling you what not to do, if it also helps you in certain areas, well, then you may stay engaged. And it will be a combination of the two. And one of the big challenges will be how can you make sure that the weakest in our society, those with the least money or the least education, are also uh, able to absorb this? Because otherwise, we're not going to have only a digital divide. We also may have an even grow bigger health divide. That will be a challenge again, where probably society uh, has, to, has to help. So, and I, but I do think without those types of approaches, indeed it won't work, because we all already know what we have to do. Internal motivation works for 10% of the people. Legislation is going to add another layer. Quality of feedback, that you really get something back uh, from your device and from your app, is going to help. And then we see how far do we go. What if the outcome is that we should work less? So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, there is an interest from governments in changing rules uh, from results from your analysis. Is that something you are collecting? So it's a very, it's a very good question. Huh? The, um, my, my somewhat too simple answer is, let's go back in time. In the 70s, people were smoking. And then the first studies came out that smoking isn't good for your health. And then legislation came late, later followed, and it has had impact. If an outcome, a really proven outcome from sufficient trials, randomized control trials, if there's plenty of evidence that that is bad, well, I think then society will follow, as they typically do, late, later. You first also have to have evidence. But that can be, that can be a, I would say, a logical conclusion. Today, my own, if you ask my own opinion, um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, working hard has not made people sick. The cause of burnout or stress at work is not linked to the hours. It's typically linked to uh, the span of control you have, having things that are not under control. It's rather those aspects than intensity. Intensity is by many people even seen as positive. If there's not enough work, a lot of people will get more annoyed that there's not enough on their plate. So I'm not that concerned about the outcome in, in hours. I do think it will have an impact on the, on, the way, on the way we work and the way we organize work. But again, the future and the studies will reveal the, the answer. Thanks. Okay, if not, let us thank Chris again for his presentation. Thank you.